In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Everything has its proper place in creation. Everything has its proper place in creation. You're not going to find rocks floating in the air because their proper place is to be on the ground. And when we look for fish, you find them in water. And when you look for birds, you find them in the sky or perched upon a tree branch. And so as the old saying goes, everything has a place and a place for everything. Now, after our Lord's physical resurrection from the dead, he was truly a heavenly being. He no longer belonged down here on earth, for being up in heaven was his proper place. The valley of this earth was not his true home, but rather the mountain top above is where he was meant to be. But nonetheless, for 40 days after his physical resurrection from the dead, he remained here below on earth. He would appear from time to time to teach his apostles, and he would also bring further consolation to his most blessed mother. But then he would disappear. And because the earth was not truly his proper place, its environment had no real control over him. It's true that our dear Lord could head from Jerusalem to Galilee, a distance of more than 70 miles in a blink of an eye. This valley of tears had no power over him. Gravity could not weigh him down. He could no longer suffer, nor could he die. And after those 40 days were over, our dear Lord went up a mountain with his apostles and disciples, and there he ascended to the heavenly heights. Now the truth of our Lord's ascension into heaven brings us a lot of hope, for we can long to join him above as he reigns as king of all creation. If we enter into the mysteries of his life, of his death, and of his burial, we will also rise with him one day, and we will ascend on high to join him, and we will be given our own royal throne and enter heaven, which will become our proper place. Although we are still living in this world, what we call this valley of tears, the mystery of the ascension, the mystery of going upwards, climbing to the heights, should already be in us. There should be a spiritual ascension even in us now as we seek to detach further and further from earthly things so that we can truly say that this earth is not our true home, that we ultimately do not belong down here below, that we are presently out of place in this valley, and that we need to start climbing the mountain of God. The mystery, the mystery of the ascension of our dear Lord should be in us in such a way that we should feel uncomfortable with the present state of affairs in the Western world we should feel very uncomfortable. Christian gentlemen, a Christian lady should feel out of place in this culture of ours. In the West, we contracept our future, thus committing race suicide. We abort our own offspring and even change the very definition of marriage. We live for entertainments, and material things that will pass away. Greed is seen as a virtue. We love to condemn others with our scourging tongues and stabbing Facebook postings. And with immoral activities not only tolerated in the Western world, with perverse behaviors not only legalized, but also promoted and literally shoved down our throats, We might ask ourselves, is this really my country? In just turning on the network television and viewing a popular movie or so-called popular music, 
or even just reading a newspaper, an internet site, or even looking at a billboard on the side of the road, we should ask ourselves, do we really belong here? And if we feel like aliens in our own country, if we feel like foreigners in our own neighborhoods, and even like an alien in our own extended family, and if we feel great discomfort, even with the present state of the hierarchy and membership of the church, that's okay. In fact, that's good. Because if we are living the Catholic faith, which is the only faith that saves, then we will necessarily be different. We will feel out of place, even otherworldly, because we will be directly opposed to the spirit of the world which sees this world as the ultimate end. But we know that we are ultimately foreigners here below, that we are poor, banished children of Eve in exile. We're out of place in this valley of tears, and we await our own exodus, our own exit, our own ascension one day. But realize that we cannot neglect this present theater of redemption, this earthly life, for we are only able to work out our salvation when we're in the body, living and active here below. And so we must always remind ourselves and we must tell others to start climbing, climbing out of the smoggy and dark valley up the mountain of God, so that the daylight, the clear light of the Catholic faith and the clean air of sanctifying grace can further enlighten us and enliven us. We must tell our fellow men and remind ourselves that there are true mansions being constructed for us in another place. We must seek to consecrate more and more citizens to Christ by making them one day, we hope, citizens and, yes, residents of a heavenly place. And we must have others join us in climbing the mountain of God, joining in the mystery of the ascension, so that they, too, will also feel out of place, as if they don't belong here below. As a final note, there is one major point in the spiritual life that we must have ingrained in us. We must know up from down. First spiritual rule, knowing up from down. Heaven is upwards, literally. And yes, hell is downwards in the very center of the earth, farthest away from the mountain of God. You know, in the historical book, of Genesis chapter 6 to be exact, there is made mention of individuals which the Bible calls the sons of God. The so-called sons of God, Jewish tradition tells us, were actually the children of Seth. And if you know your Bible stories, Seth was the child born to Adam and Eve after the killing of their son Abel by his murderous brother Cain. And furthermore, tradition tells us that these sons of God were seeking to remain faithful to the Most High while in this fallen world. That they had sworn an oath, sworn an oath to their father Seth to stay upon the mountains and never to go down to the valleys, but rather to climb, to climb upwards so that they might at least hear the echo of the song of the angels in paradise. And such an oath was taken in order to separate themselves from the children who lived down in the valley, namely the children of men, also known as the children of Cain, the first murderer. And as long as they stayed upon the mountain and did not rebel, they would be beloved by God and even honored by angels. But in the valley below, the children of Cain regularly feasted in gluttonous ways. They were often drunk, 
They were promiscuous, lustful, greedy, and they behaved like beasts. And Jewish tradition tells us that Satan and the demons came to the valley and they inspired two brothers to make musical instruments into which the devils entered. And when the men blew into the pipes, the devils sang inside the musical instruments and sent out sounds from the pipes in order to compel the sons of God, the sons of Seth, to come down, to descend into the valley. Hearing that devilish, popular music, the sons of God started looking down into the valley. The music of the sons of Cain was so rebellious, it was so filled with volume, with disharmony and discord, and yet it attracted them. It appealed to their lowest, basest instincts. It appealed to their pride, their sensuality, and their greed. And though they had sworn, though they had sworn never to travel downwards, the sons of God, like many Catholics today, went down the mountain. And they joined in the rebellion against the Most High. And there below, the sons of Seth saw the daughters of Cain, and they were naked and unashamed. Tradition tells that these men of the mountain became inflamed, inflamed with lust while in the valley. And the Bible says that they took the daughters of Cain for wives, and they slew their souls in the process. And when the children of Seth wished to go up the holy mountain again after having come down and fallen, they were not allowed to climb. Having defiled themselves by acting lustfully, God did not permit them to ascend again to that holy place. And this event, the Bible tells us, led to God, quote, seeing the wickedness of men was so great, repented that he had made man on earth. And God said, I will destroy man whom I have created, unquote. And therefore we have the historical event of Noah and the worldwide flood. Now for those of us who have forgotten, the first spiritual rule, namely knowing up from down, for those of us who have gone downwards instead of climbing upwards, and for those of us who have truly fallen down the mountain and may have become a child of Cain in the valley, we need a time of retreat. We need a parish mission in order to know up from down. And that's why I'm here this week. I'm here this week for I hope to lead us up the mountain of God so that all of us may one day see the good Lord face to face. But I'm not only here to encourage us to climb, but also to insist that we make reparation, that we make reparation for all our rebellion against the Most High, that we seek to make repairs for the insults, the offenses, the damages, that we have aimed towards the holy face of our Savior who came down from the mountaintop in order to save us from the abyss of hell. If we do not make reparation, we shall be punished, chastised, just as those men were during the time of Noah. And so starting tomorrow, we're going to have a parish mission. And the theme of the mission is obviously climbing the mountain of God. We'll have special sermons at the morning mass at 8 a.m., followed at 9 by catechism classes in the classroom next door for both young and old. And yes, there will be special mission conferences in the evening with preaching, devotions, and singing starting at 7 p.m. And finally, there will be confessions. Confessions both before and after each mission conference. And once we have our directions right, 
knowing up from down. We can then become like pilgrims on a journey, climbing upwards until we reach our own true native land. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We will take our reading from St. John's Apocalypse. And he took me in spirit up to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and the light thereof like to a precious stone as a jasper stone as crystal. And it had a wall great and high, having twelve gates, and in the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the twelve gates are twelve pearls, one to each. And every several gate was of one several pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty is the temple thereof and the Lamb. And the city hath not sun nor moon to shine in it, for the glory of God hath enlightened it. And the Lamb is the lamp thereof, and nations shall walk in the light of it. There shall not Enter it anything defiled, or any one that worketh abomination, or a lie, but they who are written in the book of the life of the Lamb. Again, words taken from St. John's Apocalypse. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is a great privilege for me to lead you during this time of parish mission during this time of retreat for the parish. But it is also a great responsibility that I bear. For a mission, a mission is different. A mission is meant to be a time of further conversion to the very narrow way of Christ. And so if I speak without love, if I preach without deep concern for your immortal souls, then my words are ultimately empty of meaning and effect. Therefore, I would ask you to pray for me during this time of parish mission, that I would truly be an instrument of the Holy Ghost. But I want to thank you. Thank you for coming here this evening, for your desire to climb the mountain of God. But when you come here, hopefully for all evening sessions, Bring contrition for your sins. And do not forget to enter into the confessional to receive the mercy of God and the absolution of a priest. And let us not forget to make reparation. Repairs for all our offenses, all our insults towards the holy face of the Son of God and Son of Mary. So let us begin. Many of us have become very familiar with a term called bucket list. Bucket list refers to a number of experiences or achievements that a person wants to achieve in life before they kick the bucket. Of course, kick the bucket is a slang word for dying. And so therefore, many people out there want to achieve a number of things on their bucket list before they kick the bucket. But unfortunately for most modern men, the goal of reaching heaven and checking off items on a spiritual bucket list, such as staying in a state of grace, using the holy sacraments of the church, growing in virtue, maybe visiting pilgrimage sites, they are rarely considered. So focused are we on earthly goals that many of us often miss heaven for the world. So interested are we in accomplishing goals in the valley 
that we forget to climb upwards to the mountaintops. One may have visited all the states in our country. One may have visited most of the continents of the world. But if we fail to reach our eternal home above, then our bucket will not only be empty, but it will be filled with sorrow, with remorse, and with bitterness and pain. Pain of the loss of God and pain of eternal fire. Bodily death will come to all of us. But after this very short life, may we have eternal life above. Now, there are a number of ways that men die. Some die with natural sorrow, natural remorse, which is not saving. The Emperor Julian, for example. The Emperor Julian was the nephew of Constantine the Great. At first, Julian had embraced the true religion, but as time passed, he returned to the darkness of paganism. He soon became known by as Christians as being Julian the apostate. During his short reign as emperor, he sought to reestablish paganism throughout the Roman Empire and to reject and get rid of Christianity. But after being defeated in battle and mortally wounded, he looked to the skies with his fist in the air and he said, O Christ, O Galilean, thou hast conquered me. Others die without such defiance, but they die with fear, filled with fear. And such a case can be seen in the death of Voltaire, famous French revolutionary and free thinker. When Voltaire experienced a massive stroke, he was overpowered with a fearful remorse. Voltaire at once sent for a Catholic priest. He wanted to be reconciled with Christ in the church But his revolutionary disciples had other ideas, and they refused the priest's entrance. Seeing their evil plan, Voltaire cursed them to their faces. And for the next two months, he was tortured. Tortured with such agony, which led him at times to gnash his teeth in a powerless rage against God and man. But other times, in a pleading voice, He would cry out, O Christ, O Jesus, but then turning his face away from the heavens, he would lament, I must die abandoned of God and of men. Back in 1989, a funeral mass was offered for a very famous person, for the repose of the soul of the Empress Zeta. At one time, Zita had been the empress of all of Austria and the queen of Hungary. The empress Zita was a mother of eight children and also the wife of blessed Karl of Austria. Both she and her husband were wrongly deposed from their rightful thrones after the great war, and they were forced into exile. The body of this great woman was brought to the church of St. Stephen in Vienna, Austria, where a four-hour-long funeral mass was offered, complete with Mozart's famous requiem. 6,000 mourners were in attendance, and more than 50,000 Austrian citizens lined the streets of Vienna. And after the funeral mass, the body was taken to be buried in a vault, in a crypt church where many members of the royal family of the Habsburg dynasty were buried. When the coffin arrived at the door of the cemetery, an ancient ritual began. A pallbearer, a man leading the procession, knocked at the door. And behind the door, a voice was heard saying, Who wishes to enter here? The pallbearer then began to list all the titles of the woman in the coffin. The Empress Zita wishes to enter, the Empress of all Austria, and the Apostolic Queen of Hungary. But the voice behind the door, according to the ritual, responded, I do not know this person. Go away. Again, the pallbearer knocked at the door a second time, and again the second response, 
who wishes to enter here? The response this time from the pallbearer was insistent. This is the Empress Zita, the queen of Croatia and of Bohemia, and a royal family member of the Habsburg dynasty. But again, the man behind the door gave the same response. I do not know this person. Go away. Finally, a third knock and a third response. Who wishes to enter here? This time, according to the ritual, the Paul Bearer gave this proper response. We come with our sister Zeta, a sinful, mortal woman. And at this humble response, the gates of the Crypt Church were opened to take the body of Zeta to its rest. Earthly fame, earthly riches, a fine university degree, a successful professional career may make you a somebody here below. But before God, it ultimately means nothing. We cannot impress the Most High naturally speaking. We cannot boast of anything before the good Lord because we are dust, and unto dust we shall definitely return. As many of you might know, the Catholic Church has always forbidden, note the word, forbidden eulogies at Catholic funeral masses. Christ is always to be the focus, and we pray that by the power of his death and resurrection, that the departed may be brought to eternal life. See, the main problem with eulogies is that they always have to be positive, for no one would want to hear anything critical of the deceased. You don't speak ill of the dead. This mandatory praise for the departed in a eulogy is then often accompanied by an insistence that the deceased is now in heaven, sitting in a very privileged place. In addition, we always hear that refrain coming forth from many saying, well, at least he's no longer suffering. But how do we refer to those individuals who end up in the place called purgatory? They're called members of the church suffering, and they are enduring pains beyond any earthly pains. And before they can come to that heavenly triumph, they must endure those pains oftentimes. And so leave the official canonization process to Holy Mother Church. But in the end, pray for the dead. Now, over the past few decades, many people have had what are called near-death experiences, where they often see a beautiful light and they hear a gentle voice telling them to draw near. They recount seeing family members and being very much at peace. Now, I have to admit that I rarely give much credence to any of these stories, especially when those claiming such experiences are often unbelievers. What better way is there for the devil to keep a person in mortal sin, not changing their ways, than to give them a false hope, even through some imaginary white light? But I do remember watching Mother Angelica one night back in the 90s. I was watching Mother Angelica's live show on EWTN, and I saw a Catholic priest from Kansas giving an interview with her. It was a sobering interview, a near-death experience that had a lot of merit. You see, the priest had had a head-on collision with a truck, and during that collision he had broke his neck, the C2 vertebrae to be exact which is sometimes called the hangman's break. That is, he suffered the same break as victims of hangings. This priest claimed that he then was brought before the judgment seat of Christ. The priest was quite lax in his spiritual life. He liked his scotch. He liked talking a lot about sports, never about religion. 
In addition, he always fell prey to peer pressure and human respect. And so he never touched upon difficult doctrines or difficult moral truths because popularity and good collections was the end game. He never prayed his breviary. The rosary he considered something of the past, an old-time devotion. In this near-death experience, a conversation between our Lord and some angels was overheard by the priest where his many unrepented sins were recounted. The priest could only shake his head in agreement because no rebuttal was possible. And after a few more moments, the judge came forward and pronounced a verdict of eternal damnation to which the priest could only agree, I know I deserve it. But then a female voice, a female voice was heard coming from near the throne of Christ saying, please spare him. Christ turned and spoke to the woman, saying that this man had had plenty of years to repent and to live a priestly life. But the woman, who was the mother of the judge, insisted and pleaded, insisted that her son give him another chance and more graces. The Virgin Mary concluded that if this priest did not bear fruit after this mercy, then he could be judged and condemned. When I viewed this program about this near-death experience, and when I saw the fear and yet the relief in the priest's face, as well as his obvious change in life, I felt his story was real. And it made me think. It made me think seriously about my own state of soul. Because as a Catholic priest, and avowed religious, I have great responsibilities. And I will be held responsible not just for my own soul, but the souls that I am called to guide, if only for the length of a parish mission. I am a shepherd in addition to being a member of the flock of Christ. And I remember those words of St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystic who said that most priests end up in hell. Tempus fugit, memento mori, time flies, remember death. This was the constant meditation of the saints. But as for the unbelievers, the pagans of old, they avoided such thoughts In fact, since life was so short on earth, the pagans would cry out, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die anyway. But believers, the saints, the Christian faithful, they focused on the shortness of life, and it kept them from committing sin, and it kept them climbing towards heaven. Our time is very short. Eternity awaits us. Eternity. Eternity is duration without end. Nothing, nothing can measure eternity. Our modern age prides itself on measuring and calculating all things. We know the depths of some oceans. We know the size of some stars and planets but we cannot measure eternity. If you add any number to eternity, you will not increase its length. If you subtract any number from eternity, will you will not decrease its duration. Forever and ever and ever. Non-ending, never-ending. These are the only terms that can possibly describe the length of eternity. How long will a saint enjoy the delights of heaven? And how long will an unrepentant sinner endure the dungeon and the fires of hell? Forever and ever and ever.
You know, there is only one step between us and eternity. We are a heart attack away from facing Christ the judge. We are just one step, a car accident, away from delights or woes. Even a bite from a poisonous reptile, a bite from a spider, could send us from a temporal realm on earth to an eternal realm above or below. Our eternity is based upon our life on earth. How we have sowed, we will reap. Our actions, good or bad, are like seeds planted for eternity. And as all the missionaries used to say of old to congregations, if one of us died tonight, where would we spend eternity? Everything, therefore, should be looked at through the lens of eternity. St. Teresa of Jesus, who I mentioned earlier, the great Carmelite mystic, when she was just a child, she would head off into solitary confinement in a way, into a little hermitage. And there she would pray. She would say to be eternally happy or to be eternally unhappy. Make your choice. I think, too, of St. Stanislaus Koska, that pure Polish boy. St. Stanislaus Koska, who always would say, I was born not for present things. I was born for eternal things. Then another pure boy, a pure young man named St. Aloysius Gonzaga, that Jesuit seminarian, when he was ever tempted to commit even the smallest sin, he would make a comparison. He would say, what is this to eternity? And then he would add, whatever is not eternal is ultimately nothing. Let me remind all of us gathered here this evening that heaven is not our natural birthright. We don't deserve eternal salvation, naturally speaking, and in pure justice, we are not owed eternal rest. Heaven is not a natural end for men on earth, and no natural work of man, no human riches, no earthly fame, and no merely human deeds will give us entrance to that which is above the Holy Bible is clear that in our fallen condition, we are naturally children of wrath, St. Paul. And if we're deserving of anything of ourselves, it is eternal damnation. The only thing that truly pleases the Most High is seeing the life of his Son within our soul, being in the state of sanctifying grace, having a participation in God's divine nature, as St. Peter says, having no unrepented mortal sins that remain upon our soul. These things please the Lord. And that is why knowing his creature was meant for higher things. The good Lord made our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the state of grace so that they could climb the mountain. Now, such teachings, such teachings of Holy Mother Church should cause us to think, to even meditate upon what the Church has called the four last things. Death, judgment, hell, and heaven. And at our death, as I have mentioned, we will be judged and we're going to be judged according to supernatural grounds, not whether we were a nice person in the world's estimation. If we have sanctifying grace in our soul, we will be judged with mercy. But ultimately, if we reject this supernatural gift through unrepented mortal sin, we will end up in the pit and the abyss of hell. 
We were made for heaven. Every one of us. And it would be a travesty if we failed to make it. An acorn can look very good. An acorn can be very, very healthy. But if it doesn't become a tree, it is ultimately a failure. Just a few years ago, the magazine U.S. News and World Report had an article called Hell Hath No Fury. In fact, the front cover of the magazine showed some occupants of hell on lawn chairs with sunglasses sipping cocktails. And the article concluded that modern man has a new view of hell that is not necessarily in line with the revelation of the Son of God. Allow me to give you a quotation from the article. Quote, with fire and brimstone out of fashion. Modern thinking says that hell isn't so hot after all. The paragraph continues, educated Americans would reject notions of a blazing underworld where anguished souls writhe in endless torment. A literal hell is part of an understanding of the cosmos that just doesn't exist anymore, unquote. That is modern thinking. But the divine revelation of the Son of God, who is truth come in the flesh, says that those who die in the state of unrepented mortal sin descend immediately into hell, where they suffer the eternal loss of God and the eternal pain of fire. You see, our Lord said many times that the road to hell was wide, And it always goes downhill. And many are them that pass that way. A biblical proof text for the fact that hell is real and that it's also populated by human beings at this moment is found in verse 7 of the letter of St. Jude. You see, there's many people out there today, Catholics included, who will tell you, well, there is a hell, but no one ever goes there. But St. Jude's letter says differently. St. Jude's letter, chapter 1, verse 7 says, Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns indulged in promiscuity and practiced unnatural vice. And they serve as an example as they presently, note the adverb, as they presently suffer a punishment of eternal fire. Therefore, we dare not hope, dear people, that hell is somehow unoccupied. And just to correct the sort of modernist, heretical interpretations of this passage, these men were not condemned to eternal hellfire for their lack of hospitality towards guests, obliterating a number of cities for not providing a cup of coffee to visitors would be just a little bit out of proportion. Now, these men of Sodom were clearly punished with fire on earth and fire in hell because of unnatural, lustful behavior. There are four sins that cry to heaven for vengeance. And a San Francisco lifestyle is one of them. And the Supreme Court should pay attention to that. Although heaven's gates were certainly closed after Adam's sin, the gates of hell were never closed. Not only are demons there present in the fires, but also men who have been damned. The Bible is clear. If hell is somehow empty of human souls, which some suggest, then the Bible, our dear Lord, our Lady of Fatima, and the church tradition has lied to us. Before the modern age, Catholics had no trouble with hell being occupied. The New Testament states that Judas, for example, was a son of perdition 
a son of loss, that it would have been better if he had never been born. And the book of Acts says that Judas went to his own place below. I think, too, of the Roman Catechism, the great catechism of the Council of Trent, which taught that, quote, Judas hanged himself and thus lost both soul and body. It brought him everlasting destruction, unquote. Council of Trent Catechism. The author Dante, in one of his books, put Judas in the very mouth of Satan, in the lowest spot in hell because of his betrayal of Christ. But oh, how things have changed. How things have changed in the modern world where we see a group of Jesuit priests start an unofficial canonization process of Judas Iscariot. And yes, a recent book called The Passover Plot, where a modern Catholic scholar suggests that Judas worked behind the scenes with a willing Christ to bring about the fulfillment of prophecy, that Judas was but a willing catalyst to bring about salvation, therefore doing the will of God. Now, in the Holy Gospel, a man asks our dear Lord, Lord, will only a few men be saved? Today, many feel that all will be saved. Universal or near universal salvation is a common belief. In a diocesan newspaper, but a diocesan newspaper, an edited version of the St. Michael prayer was printed for people to pray. The edited version of St. Michael prayer in a diocesan newspaper read the following, quote, Thrust into hell, Satan, all the evil spirits. Sounds good so far. But then it adds, That is, dear St. Michael, until the Lord has said enough and allows Lucifer to return home by the way of the foot of the cross, where at the feet of Jesus, Lucifer will find salvation. This is where it's headed. The heresy of universalism, where all are saved. But you know, the saints, the doctors, the fathers, the councils of Holy Church have a far less sanguine view of the notion of human salvation. The fathers of the church, including St. Irenaeus, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Basil, state that the majority of humanity will end up below. St. Augustine did admit, and the Bible confirms it, that heaven is very populated. But he says that the number of the saved is exceeded by the number of the damned. And as for St. John Chrysostom, perhaps the greatest preacher in the history of the church. St. John Chrysostom once said, among thousands of people, there are not a hundred who will be saved. And I'm not sure of that number because of the perversity amongst the young and the negligence amongst the old, unquote. You see, on July 13th, 1917, Our Lady of Fatima showed a vision of an occupied hell to the three seers. Later on, Blessed Jacinta, Blessed Jacinta of Fatima stated, quote, So many people are dying and almost all of them are going to hell. Sister Lucia, another of the visionaries who saw an occupied hell, once wrote, taking into account the behavior of the human race, only a small part of the race will be saved. Now many, many do not like to use these quotations from the saints and from visionaries. Many are concerned that such quotations may bring about a lessening of hope, if not outright despair. 
But modern men need to hear this in order to avoid also another sin against hope, that is the sin of presumption, where a man sins at will and just assumes that he will be saved. But the saints have told us over and over again, those who abuse the mercy of God will be abandoned by God. Now we must ask, what are the punishments in the pit of hell? There's a twofold punishment, namely the pain of loss, losing God. There's also a pain of sense, the suffering caused by an outside material thing. The pain of loss, that's the essence of hell, to lose God. You can lose your wallet, you can lose a piece of jewelry, you could even lose your beloved spouse, but to lose Almighty God, who is the universal good, all good comes from him, is a loss beyond any calculation. But to lose God, that is the essence. But there's also a fire, a fire that adds to the misery. That secondary punishment of hell, namely the pain of sense, fiery pain, may not be the essence of the loss of God, which is damnation, but it is the first punishment that most people consider. Oftentimes the fear of pain, the fear of eternal torture, causes that gut-wrenching fear that brings about the beginnings of conversion. Because if you have a person who is distant from God, who might be an habitual mortal sin. If you tell them, you may not see God face to face, they might say, fine. But if you were to say to them that there is a fiery pain, an eternal torture, that might impress him. Because in the book of Revelation, St. John clearly tells the godless shall have their portion in the pool with burning fire, and that they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hell is a tough teaching. Hell is a tough teaching. And that's why when people ask, who told us about this teaching on hell? People will say, oh, it must have been some Old Testament prophet. Or some might say, oh, it must have been that hardliner, St. Paul the Apostle. But when you look at the Bible, the man, the individual, the God become man, who reveals to us hell, Jesus Christ, he is the revealer of hell. He told us. This is the other side of Christ that people don't like to talk about. But our Lord, in order to impress upon us the reality of hell, left us with a mental picture. Because he called hell Gehenna, oftentimes. He called the eternal fires below Gehenna. Because Gehenna was a real location in the Holy Land. A place that had an infamous history. You see, Gehenna was the place where a fiery pit was constantly burning and where pagan priests would always put more fuel to keep the fires alive. The pagan ministers also had a band that would play musical instruments around the pit. These pagan ministers served and worshipped a false god named Moloch. This god promised good fortune to those who offered children in sacrifice. Apostate Jews, faithless Hebrews, looking for advancement and better luck in their dreary lives, would bring their infants to Gehenna. And they would hand them to the pagan priests, who in turn would throw these children alive into the fire. And the band would play the louder music to cover up the shrieks and cries. Gehenna, you see, was a real place. 
It was a place of child sacrifice, a hell on earth. Therefore, we must avoid it at all costs by God's grace. Because it is forever and ever and ever. If hell were just for a hundred years, wouldn't we want to avoid it for avoiding the vile pleasure of one moment? Just using our own rationality, would I want to avoid a dungeon sentence of a hundred years and all I would have to do is to avoid a vile pleasure of a few minutes? But we're not talking here about 30 years or 100 years or even 100,000 years. We're talking about forever because hell will never end. But let us end this conference and let us end such thoughts by speaking of our proper end, the very mountaintop of God. The great apostle St. Paul once wrote in his letter, he wrote about heaven saying, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Eternal, nonstop happiness and joy in possessing the good God. Now, despite what some modernists teach, heaven is not only a spiritual reality, but it is also a place, a place where the holy bodies of our blessed Lord, our blessed mother and St. Joseph presently reside. And also we pray one day that our glorified bodies will also one day be for not only are the souls of the just saved, but also their bodies. It is not just the salvation of souls we seek, the salvation of our bodies too. In fact, a glorified creation awaits us, and it will be set before our eyes in heaven. St. Augustine, the great church father, St. Anselm, and many other saints do not hesitate to tell that in heaven there are real trees, real fruits, and yes, real flowers, indescribably beautiful to the sight, taste, smell, and touch. And the revelations of the saints, mention is made of gardens in heaven and the flowers that blossom there. And we know from the stories connected with the great martyr St. Dorothy, that she sent to some man on earth by the hands of an angel a basket filled with flowers plucked from the gardens of heaven. And these flowers were of such beauty that it literally caused the man to convert to the true faith. Again, if heaven is a definite place, it must also be a visible kingdom, not just purely a spiritual kingdom. Consider what again that great Carmelite mystic, St. Teresa of Jesus said, she said, the blessed mother of God gave me a jewel, gave me a jewel from heaven that she hung around my neck. She also gave me a superb golden chain to which a cross of priceless value was attached, all from heaven. Both the gold and precious stones thus given to me by the blessed mother, said St. Teresa, are so unlike those which we have in this world, that no comparison can be made between them. They are beautiful beyond anything that can be conceived, and the material of which they are made is beyond human knowledge. For what we call gold and precious stones on earth, next to those heavenly stones, appear as dark and dingy as charcoal. St. Bernard also says that it is worthy of belief that every one of the saved will be given his own inheritance in heaven above. In my Father's house, the Lord says, there are many mansions. 
From this gospel verse, it seems that each one of the redeemed has his own separate mansion in heaven. For just as a father divides his inheritance, his personal property, his real estate amongst his children, so our heavenly father gives to each of his elect a part of his treasure. Knowing, knowing that all of us will sooner or later pass from this world, let us not miss heaven for the world. Because our God, our God is a God who dwells above, beyond the mountains. The road up this mountain of God to heaven is very narrow, and it is also steep. The terrain is especially difficult for fallen men like ourselves. It is so easy to go down. It is so hard to climb upwards. Knowing our condition and pitying our fallen nature, that God of the mountain sent his only son. He sent his holy son down to the valley down to the Jericho of this world. And he sought to take us from our sinful condition. He sought to suffer and to die and to rescue us from falling into the pit of hell and to restore us to the life of grace so that we might climb, climb upwards to the mountain and see him face to face. Let us now turn to our Savior and offer him both our adoration and loving acts of reparation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.